So actually, so, so Bill's gotten a lot of press already, um, but I want to acknowledge my, my co-author, Bill, who, who put in a ton of work on this paper um, and has just been a great help to me personally. So uh, thank you, Bill, for everything. Uh, our paper is called A Study of Practical Deduplication, and, and already this sets up uh, a compelling contrast. On, on one hand of the title, we have deduplication, which is a very dynamic, exciting area of research. And on the other hand, we have a file system study, which is a little more cognitive. Um, nothing against file system studies. File system studies are great, wonderful, incredibly valuable part of the design process. Sometimes they don't make the most interesting talks. So what I'm going to try to do today is find a middle ground between these two extremes <laughs> and present what I hope is at least moderately interesting talk about uh, deduplication research in the form of a file system study. So, so why are we here? What's this paper all about? So like I said, deduplication is, is this really hot area. Uh, I, I'm just, I'm not totally sure it's such a good idea. F fundamentally, there's a trade-off you're making here. You're, you're, you're fragmenting data. You're giving up the linearity of your access to data. And in exchange, you're getting more storage space. And that's kind of peculiar in storage, right? Usually, usually we do the opposite. Usually we think, well, seeks, those are extremely expensive. Storage space is usually pretty cheap. So, so something interesting is going on here. And, and when I set up that trade-off, I understand, I'm not being naive. I, I, I know that the history of, of deduplication is tied to a comparison to tape backup. And in tape backup, capacity is very important. And well, seeks are kind of prohibitive anyway. So, so deduplication looks pretty good in comparison. But, Still, I, I, I want to ask the question whether this is the right trade-off to continue to make going forward. Remember, the, the seeks, they're not going to get cheaper. The storage space is. Also, uh, when, we, when we think about studying deduplication or studying duplicate data, it's worth stepping back and widening our perspective a little bit. We have to think also about the storage interface, the network interfaces. Other people have done work on this. There, there's a lot of big wins to be had in exploiting duplicate data. So I'm going to mostly talk about this, but keep, keep that in the back of your head. Uh, so, so let me retract my inflammatory statement at the start of the talk. Uh, I'm very excited about deduplication, um, but I think deduplication everywhere is probably the wrong idea. The question is when and where. And of course, the answer is it depends. So, so how do you make this decision about when and where you want to exploit duplicate data? I, I think it comes down to three issues. The first is how much you can get back from deduplicating. So where are those duplicates in your system? How many are there? There's also a question of how that deduplication, how the, the deduplication process affects performance. And, and that, that, as I've set it up, is largely the question of seeks. Like, what's it, what's it cost to do a seek in your deduplicated system? Also, what's it cost to find those duplicates? And the third question is, how cold is that data? If it's going to sit on a shelf forever, well, then, sure. Obviously, any cost of seeks is acceptable because you'll never read it. And what, what I'm going to do today is really just address the first of these three questions. We're not going to get into the others. And we're going to look from the, from the context, really, of workstation desktop file systems. And, and I'm going to show how you can, you can collapse the, the consumed space within 20% of very aggressive fine-grained duplication without incurring any extra seeks. And then I'm going to go further to show how you can get that number down into the single digits. So, so this is my outline for today. In doing, this is, as I said, this is a large file system study. And so we have, a, we have a tremendous amount of data at our disposal. And there's a lot of different stories I could tell with that data. I'm going to restrict myself just to one story. And that's going to be the deduplication story. But I also want to, to, to take a moment to convey the full breadth of the contribution. So after I go through methodology, I'm going to give a little teaser about some of the other things that are in this data set, just to give you some, some hints as to what else we can calculate. Uh, and then I'll check back in with this outline as I steer us back on track onto deduplication. So to gather the necessary data, we needed a large pool of compute. That's Bill and I. Um, we needed a large set of computers, so we, we randomly selected around 10,000 employees on Microsoft Campus. And, and I want to point out, there, there's of course a lot of programmers in this study, but Microsoft, they hire more than programmers. They also have lawyers. <laughs> the, 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 the point I'm trying to make is that it, this is a large software company, right? So we have lawyers, we have administrative staff, we have managers and testers. 
Um, so I, I emailed these 10,000 people to ask very nicely, uh, I've written some software, I'm looking for volunteers. If you install this on your computer, what it's gonna do is it's gonna scan every file system you have attached to that computer. It's gonna look through all your files. And it's gonna send back a huge log report to me about that data. And of course, I'll, I'll tell you that because it's, um, because we're interested in deduplication, we're very interested in the content of those file systems. But of course, copying the actual data content back to our servers that probably would be unacceptable. People wouldn't like that so much. So what we have to do is we have to take hashes of the content and, and copy that back. And as you'll see, we're interested in deduplication, a, a number of different approaches to deduplication. So we actually had to perform all of those approaches on the subject's machines, copy all those hashes back, and that's what we've done. So still, this is an invasive scan. Um, it, it led to some amusing emails where people were concerned that Bill had a rogue intern who was installing rootkits all over Microsoft. <laughs> Not true. But we, we, we helped incentivize by, by letting it be known that one lucky participant would get a prize at the end of the study. So, so that's, <laughs> it works, it works, it does. So ultimately we got about a 10% uptake rate. So 10% of the people volunteered to do this scan. And on the data collection side, we, we import all this data into the SQL Server. That lets us do um, analysis via SQL query, which is very convenient. And, and we're collecting, uh, we, we let this run for four weeks, and we're collecting hundreds of millions of files per week, about 40 terabytes a week for 162 terabytes total. And over the course of the scan, we have about 900 file systems consistently. So as I've said, there's more here than deduplication. Um, Microsoft has previously published studies very similar to this, both large-scale studies of deduplication in 2000 and 2004. So, so part of what we're doing here is we're contributing to a longitudinal understanding of how file systems are evolving over time. And this is really important. Um, we have lots of results in the paper about how file system complexity is growing. There's more files, bigger files, things like that. Uh, I'm just going to give a couple quick teasers to give a, you and I a feel for what's in the full paper. For example, simple straw man question. Are my files bigger now than they used to be? And of course, they're not. Uh, well, okay, so they're not bigger by frequency. Most of the files are the same size. So this is the histogram, this is distribution of file sizes. Pretty much unchanged from previous years. The median file size is 4K. It was 4K the other two years of the study. We've actually gone back through the literature. It turns out it's 4K in every study going back the last 30 years. So this is great news. We can finally compete with physicists we have our own fundamental constant of the universe. It's median file size. So an another example of what you can do with this data set. Um, there's, a, there's a doctrine that says, it, this is a very important doctrine that says, when you're evaluating, when you're measuring a new storage system, you have to age that file system. Because over time, files become fragmented, and performance changes really dramatically. So, so we, and we, as far as we're aware, no one has really looked at this in a large observational study, so we thought, well, how fragmented are the files? Um, and interestingly, they're really not. And it's not terribly hard to guess why. Windows machines nowadays defragment weekly, and this effectively solves the problem. So good news, right? Um, one thing that's interesting that came out of this, though, is that f files that are fragmented tend to be highly fragmented, and the culprit seems to be programmers doing small appends at the end of things like log files. So watch out programmers, perhaps consider allocating in larger chunks. Okay, so those are, those are just two teasers to, to take us offline a little bit and uh, show you that we have tons of great metadata results that you all can use in your actual systems even if you're not interested in duplicate data for some crazy reason. Um, but before I go into the actual more graphs on deduplication, I wanna make sure that everyone's on the same page about how deduplication is done from an implementation level. So if we start with the intuition, that we sometimes store the same data, exactly the same data, in, in two logically different files, we might go about implementing something relatively simple called whole file deduplication. And it's almost self-explanatory, right? You, you have the data in two places, you instead store it in one place, and you have both files reference that data. Uh, if, if anyone writes to these logical files, it's copy on write. And you save a bunch of disk space, right? Uh, in fact, this has been around for a long time. This is in, this is in Windows, it's been there for a decade. It's called single instance storage. Uh, overheads are very low. It's easy to tell if two files are duplicates. For example, file size gives you kind of a fast-fail option. If two files aren't the same size, they're not duplicates. And, and as I've said, you preserve linearity on disk, which is a, a core feature of this. But 
if someone goes and appends, does one of these small appends, they put a byte on the end of the file or they change one byte in the file, you lose your whole duplicate and that's kind of depressing. But if you're willing to give up that file linearity, you can do kind of the next simplest thing, which is to break the file into little chunks and you do fixed chunk deduplication. Each of those chunks gets a duplicate and of course that last chunk on the end, those, that's actually different so it, it doesn't duplicate but that's fine. You can decide what granularity you want to do this at as well. And that works pretty well until someone inserts into the file. And that just messes everything up because all your data is shifted down and your chunks don't match up anymore. But there's a there's this sort of brilliant solution to this where you take a sliding window over the data and, and you watch the, you take a hash inside that window, you watch the lower order bits of that hash and you wait for it to hit some predetermined value, usually zero. And when, when the lower order bits of that hash are zero, then you say, aha, chunk boundary. And what that means is that your chunk boundaries are based on the data. So when you insert into the, when you insert into this file, you're sliding the data down, sure, but you slide the chunk boundaries too. And that means you're gonna preserve a lot of these um, duplicates or you're gonna preserve a lot of that deduplication under insert. The, the basic approach is called Rabin fingerprinting. This is the basis of what's used in commercial deduplication systems. Uh, again, so more computationally complex and you are again fragmenting data, but you get great deduplication. So this table shows you basically nothing that I haven't already told you. Um, the, the way I'm setting this up, there are a, a couple different ways to parameterize the deduplication space. One is algorithm. You can look at whole file, fixed chunk, or Rabin fingerprints, and we're gonna analyze those. Uh, and you can parameterize fixed chunk and Rabin fingerprints by chunk size. And of course, in fixed chunk, you're looking at chunk size, and in Rabin, you're looking at average chunk size. And there's a, there's a cost associated with these, both in um, seeks and uh, the complexity of analyzing them. We're not gonna go into actual measurements of cost. Suffice to say, whole file's the cheapest, Rabin fingerprints the more, is the most expensive. Um, but in exchange for all that hard work, you get corresponding duplication rates, deduplication rates. So the, the only question really left is, you know, what, are, what are the actual numbers? What kind of deduplication rates do you get? Um, uh, so here's, here's a, um, a query of our database for the third week of September, we're just looking at one week, uh, and those are the three algorithms. This is simulating what would happen if we took all the file systems in our study for that week and we put it onto some kind of shared storage and deduplicated that. So it's a, it's a point in time deduplication. The y-axis the y shows storage space that we have successfully deduplicated. Uh, X-axis then is chunk size, which again doesn't, doesn't really affect whole file. Whole file is just flat all the way across, but it does affect fixed chunk at Rabin. And if you look at these in order of increasing storage reclamation, you also see them in order of increasing complexity. Over our large set of machines, which again is around 900 machines, we see about a 50% savings with whole file. If you're willing to, and again, you're preserving linearity, simple approach. If you're willing to go up in complexity a little bit, give up some linearity, you can go to fixed chunk, and you're gonna get between seven and 12% improvement. And then you can go up in complexity again and go to Rabin and you get another 8% on top of that. So in total, if you have a big pool of machines like this, you're willing to pay for the, the most costly algorithm we looked at, which is 8K chunk size Rabin, you can cut 70% of your storage, which is great. So, um, and the difference between the two, you, you'll note, is, is right around 20%. So that's, that's where I got the number from the top of the slide. There's around a 20% difference. We're gonna see that over and over. Now, you, you might be surprised that this isn't actually better. There, there's, a, there's a number that's quoted commercially often, which is 20x deduplication. This is not 20x deduplication. The way that they're getting to 20x deduplication is um, by doing a weekly full backup. And weekly full backup means you're backing up all your data every week, even if it hasn't changed. So you're doing something considerably simpler than even our sync. Uh, and on top of that, often there's a compression factor, which usually is estimated at 2x. And we're not gonna get into that. But we can, because we did a, a longitudinal study over four weeks, we can look at th this full backup case. And, and what we find is that the, the difference is actually smaller. There's only a 16% difference between the most aggressive Rabin fingerprinting and whole file deduplication. And a full half of that difference actually comes from zeros. So you could use sparse files. A sparse file supports in, I think, every file system that's widely used these days. You could use sparse file support to capture those zeros quite cheaply, quite easily. Very simple, and you'd get you know in between down to eight uh, percent. And not surprisingly, here we're deduping over four weeks, and we're cutting storage by around seventy-five percent, right? Because you tend to back up the same files over and over, and you're storing it once instead of four times, seventy-five percent. 
So we've talked about how to parameterize deduplication. We, we've looked at it over time a little bit. One thing we haven't done is we've looked at the number of file systems. So, so we, we have around 900 file systems in our, in our data set, but we can, of course, subsample the database to generate different sizes. And I might call this group size or, or file system count. Here's the deduplication by file system count. Same data set as the first graph. Um, again, y-axis is space deduplicated. On the x-axis here, we, we are subsampling the database to, to gather the, the necessary size of file, the necessary group size of file systems. So, for example, uh, to, get, to get that number eight, we, we query the database, we randomly select eight file systems, we calculate the deduplication rate. Each of these data points is an average of 10 trials. Note that the x-axis is logarithmic here, so we're collapsing some of that curve. And, and interestingly, each of these algorithms benefits really similarly uh, from increasing the file system count, about 30% over the course of machines that we had access to. From bottom to top, we have whole file again. I'm giving you the two extremes of chunk size for fixed chunk and Rabin on top of that. Um, file system count makes a big difference. So, so the message here really is that as your, as, your, as your group size gets bigger, that starts to dominate the other parameters we looked at. If you, if you have a choice between changing your algorithm or, or adding more machines to the pool, from a deduplication perspective, adding more machines to the pool is the big win. And again, you see that at the, pretty much the whole way through, it's a 20% gap. So, so the, the, the surprising thing to me is that whole file really is able to keep up with these other more sophisticated algorithms. So, so we've kind of hit our 20% our, our number that's been consistent in all the graphs, but I, I want to do better than 20%. And to do that, we have to, we have to, we have to dig down into the deduplication, sorry, the metadata analysis a little more. So, so let's take a look at what's filling up all this space. This is, this is a graph of bytes by containing file size over, and I have the results for all three years that we've looked at. The, the y-axis is the percentage of total bytes in the data set. The x-axis are bins of file size. So, for example, if you want to know um, in 2009, that's the orange line, 4 meg files, you can kind of follow that up and see it's 8%. 4 meg files took up 8% of the total storage space. And the interesting thing here is that we've really gone bimodal, haven't we? So you can see a hint of it in 2004. You see a little peak just starting to come up. But now it's really clear. So we have, we have two distinct classes of files suddenly. We have, we have the, the smaller or the more normal-sized files, which are in the, the 10 megabyte range, give or take. Uh, and that's the, that's the bigger bump there. But we also have this emerging class of giant files. These are in the 8 gigabytes, 10 gigabyte range. And, and by the way, this is, this is interesting just in terms of general metadata analysis, right? It's not just deduplication. This is, this is something to keep our eye on. Um, so, but what are these files? What types are they? Well, what types take up disk space? So we're going to be sampling from both of those big pools. This is, again, I have, we have all three years, disk consumption by file type. And in 2009, we can see we've picked the top 10 file types in terms of their, their consumption. And we've stacked them, so further on the graph is more consumption. I want to I point out a, a few of these types that I think are interesting. The top is ISO. This is, of course, an optical media disk image format. Next down is VHD. That's Microsoft's virtual hard disk format. This is a disk image used for virtual machines. And these are both very complicated file types. The, the, also, these are the huge files, the giant files we're talking about. Very complicated files, rich internal structures. They're, they're whole file systems, right? These, these are entire whole file systems that when you put them on your file system, your file system is acting more like a volume manager in storing a whole sub namespace. Uh, the, the null extension, of course, there's a lot of different types that, where the programmer neglects to put an extension, but the reason it's taking up so much space is the volume snapshot service in Windows. So again, these are sub file systems that are taking up a whole bunch of space. And just parenthetically, these types really bug me because the way you'd like to deal with them is as a sub namespace where you can reach in and you can pull out files, you can move around, you can manipulate them. But to do that, you really have to load some other application to access them. It's very annoying. And it also affects deduplication, as we're going to see in a minute. So, so it's worth asking, which of these types do you duplicate well? Let me go back. So, so what do we see here? DLL, lib, VHD, PDB, executable. These are the ones that are taking up the most space. And what what you want to see on the next slide is that these are the types that really deduplicate well. So I'm going to look first at whole file duplicates because those are in some sense the easiest to catch. Um, and, and surprise, there they are, right? This is great news. So, so DLLs deduplicate really well. So 10% of total space are DLLs, 20% of deduplicate space are DLLs. 
And of course, this is because Microsoft, when they ship DLLs, they ship a lot of DLLs, and they're similar across all Windows machines. So they deduplicate in system images really well. And we see lib and PDB executable cabinet files. But the, the more interesting question here probably are the other files, the files that don't do whole file dupl deduplication really well. Because what I'd like to do is just use whole file deduplication, but there's this annoying 20% gap that I want to shrink down, right? So what makes up this 20% difference in terms of file type? And I'm going to throw in sparse files, because sparse files are pretty easy to catch, too. So, so what's the difference between whole file dedupe plus sparse file as compared to 8K Rabin? Uh, and, and this graph, this graph has a few, it, it, I apologize if that's hard to read, it has a few surprises. There's, at the bottom of this graph, again, we're, we're stacking the top 10 file types, just like in the previous type graph. Uh, the, the bottom of that graph, nearly 30% of the advantage of Rabin fingerprints is coming from VHD files. And of course, it's not hard to guess why, right? This is a whole file system. Every time you mount it, some timestamp is gonna change, and you lose the whole file duplicate, but Rabin is actually able to pick out these small duplicates. And then you also see uh, lib and object files, PDB. Th these are cases where uh, Rabin is really built for these, right? In, in an object file, when you recompile and change some things, stuff's gonna shift around. You're gonna pick up duplicates. So, so those are great for Rabin. But there's a, there's, I think there's an opportunity here for someone very clever to do whole file on most of your system. And just by picking out the top 10, you get over half of that 20% gap. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm running low on time. I'm going to make one last plea to read the whole paper. Uh, we, we have a ton more results. I went through maybe a quarter of what we actually show in the full paper. Um, there's also a lot to be had in this paper around doing real world file system analysis, which it turns out is kind of hard. The, the metadata analysis in the previous graph, that took eight machine months to generate, just churning on SQL queries. Luckily, we had eight machines and it paralyzed as well. Um, but it, it's only that tractable because we made a lot of careful simplifying assumptions, uh, heavy optimization on the scanning side to make sure it like, finishes in a reasonable amount of time. Uh, details of that are all in the paper. Lots of great lessons if you want to do a study like this, which I hope more people do. Um, so I'm going to conclude. Uh, recall that I started with three questions about dedupe, and I'm really only going to address one, the, the deduplication rate. The difference between whole file deduplication and fine-grained deduplication is, is generally less than 20%. And if you're willing to do some clever things, potentially you could shrink that down to just a fraction of that. Um, so that's good news, right? Also good news, fragmentation, very manageable problem as long as your file system can tolerate periods of relative inactivity. Um, and then we have a ton more metadata results in the paper. Most importantly, we're, we're in the process of releasing this data set. As much as there's a gap between what I'm able to present today and what's in the paper, there's also a gap between what's in the paper and what's in the data set. There's a ton more results there that someone needs to pull out. So we're, we're releasing this data set. It has to go through an anonymization process and release at Microsoft. So it may take a little while, but um, we're going to have that available to all of you as researchers. Uh, that's my talk for today. I'll take any questions. Hello, Mike, Mike, is it on? No. I don't see a switch. I can repeat your question okay. if, if I can hear it. I can't find a switch on this. You got it. Okay, you're on, okay, thanks. Michael Kondik, NetApp. Uh, I noticed that you measured uh, dedupe effectiveness in terms of the space removed and said yep. that there's only a 20% improvement. Obviously, you're aware that if you measure the space remaining, that's a factor of two improvement, a 50% reduction in the amount of disk space you need, which seems a lot better. Uh, uh, yes, that's right. Yeah, so it, it, I mean, it does depend on how you, right? If we wanted to make it as good as possible, we would do it in terms of a multiplicative factor. The, the, something, <laughs> something that's important here is that, you know, we're, we're right in the middle, right? So, so a 20% difference between like 95% and 75% is much bigger multiplicative factor than a difference between 50 and 70. But I just wanted to point out that the, the actual cost of your storage uh, is, it, it cares about how much space is left, not how much you removed. It's, it's proportional to the space left. All right, fair enough. Hi. I'm Asar uh, from Perbit. Um, first, I was wondering, you don't have any data points on 4K, do you? No, we don't. It's, I mean, the, the, the size of the log files that we were generating, even with 8K, was just enormous. I understand. Uh, my experience is just that there's, for whatever reasons, there, there's, I've seen a gap between going from 8K to 4K, 4K 
case seems to be a sweet spot for lots of things. Yeah, so I, I mean, in, in the range we looked at, it, it looks pretty flat, but we're not sure, right? It, it's possible that at 4K things get suddenly dramatically, non-linearly better. And, and I, I like very much the aspect that, that you show the previous data points, and I was kind of thinking what will happen when, you, when someone presents the next paper in this series. And if I were to guess, uh, you're saying that there are more bytes being stored in VHD files now than there used to be. If that's a trend that continues, I, I think that makes us being able to get these savings with whole file beautification much harder. Find it, those, those files being duplicates. Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, and uh, and I think you're right. I think that if I if I came back in five years having done this study again, it's it probably is going to be pretty close at current rates. Uh, my hope really is that we, we can open up these VHD files a little bit and get an interface that exposes some of the sub-file structure in there. Because there's a ton of structure. It's not just deduplication, right? right. We want this generally. And, and, and I think that you would see the much better deduplication on 4K fixed block on your VHDs, because I don't think the revenue is buying all, all that much, because nothing is going to move around all that much inside uh, a disk image. It's just that most likely your NTFS uh, sectors are 4K, inside that file system. So, so maybe. maybe. Maybe the reason that, uh, that 8K fixed is, is actually quite a bit different from 8K Rabin is that we just need to go down one size, possibly. I'm not sure. Thank you very much. Thanks. So uh, on your slide where you show that the, the x-axis has the number of, of machines you're using. I already know what you're going to ask. Yeah, when you have one machine, you get a lot of deduplication. Yeah. So I, I was wondering. Um, is that is that the same? Is that a programmer's machine? Well, I mean, if you look at the lawyer's well, machine, so does it do that? It, or? It's 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 average of ten trials. Um, I, I, yeah, in the ten trials. Sorry, wait. Bill, Bill's telling me I'm kind? Bill's telling me I'm calculating wrong. Oh, I oh okay. I'm sorry. I, I, I said that completely wrong. I see. Got it, got it. So, so, so obviously, as I you see. go longer, then the, the standard deviation is going to narrow, right? I mean, for the one, I, my, my basic question is, for the, 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 the amount of deduplication you see on average, is, is that biased? Is that, is that truly an average, or is that really reflective of of the majority um, kind of, of workload that you have. I mean, the programmers. <laughs> I, I actually don't know what the distribution is. So okay. No. I, I have no okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> what? Okay. Oh, sorry. So, so uh, I, I misspoke when I explained this earlier. The, the, the trials here isn't, so for the, in the case of one machine, it's not just a practice of picking one random machine and running it 10 times. It's a practice of, grouping machines into a group of size one, which is all the machines, and, and taking the average there. And the question was, well, how does this distribution look? Is it very wide? Uh, we're not sure right now. We have the data, we just haven't, we haven't plotted that yet. Okay. Uh, Chris Lohm. So one interesting challenge for what you're doing is that, at least from the non-backup use case, you're basically taking a backup tune deduplication system and trying to apply that towards primary storage. So in somewhat relationship to the question of does 4K do better than say 8K? To some degree, but there's also a somewhat of an intimate relationship between uh, deduplication compression and localized say gzip, lzip compression. And I understand given your limitations of what's your data collection, uh, it would be nice for say future work to try to get some measure and idea of how does deduplication and local compression compared as a, as a function of total compression, and ideally also giving the option to um, use smaller segment sizes, because as you shrink segment size, local compression goes down, right. deduplication goes up. Right. And so there, there's an, a really interesting trade-off there, and it's, it's actually kind of an interesting discussion to, to see how they compare um, together. And do you plan to, to look at that in the future at some point? Um. Oh, let's say yes. I mean, I agree. Uh, it, <laughs> I, I completely agree. It, 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 there, there is a really interesting relationship that for, for constraints we weren't able to grab. And hopefully someone, perhaps us, will do that. Thank you. I have a question. Yep. Uh, 
I'm curious about, we can talk more about the self-selected group that actually ran this program. Like, were, were there any lawyers in that set? <laughs> uh, right, so, so there's, well, any, any study like this, there's self-selection, right? Um, and one of the interesting things about this study is that it's, it's not self-selecting in the sense that these are people who have already bought into, bought for, paid for deduplication. Um, but there are other forms in which being self-selecting, these are people who volunteered to let their file systems be studied. Uh, my guess is that relative to average, there are fewer lawyers who agree to this type of scan just because they know that they have data on their machines that just cannot possibly be released, even though we took every step to preserve privacy. Um, I was looking at the deduplication slide, uh, the first slide that you showed. Okay. Yeah. So as you increase the chunk size, why is the deduplication increasing? So as you decrease the chunk size, so I should, perhaps should have mentioned we have we have 64k chunks on the left hand side, and as we go to the right, oh, we go to 8k so chunks, uh, and we're actually getting more uh, yeah. more that's captured. Right. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. So in the graph that you were showing more machines, there's a bump at the fixed size at yep. 256. Did you? Right there. Sorry, yeah, at the five, sorry, 512, it goes yeah. down. Yeah, uh, we're, we're not exactly sure why that is. We're sure it's really an effect that we're seeing in the data. So we've, we've ran that a few times to try and understand, but we're, we're not exactly sure why that dips at that point. Okay. 